everybody, welcome to episode number 561 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry, brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by yours truly, Amelia Dalton. Folks, we are flipping the script on a whole lot of stuff this week. We're talking about how Flux is radically changing the PCB design game and how life on other planets may be more common than we think. But first, let's bring in Matthias Wagner from Flux. Matthias and I investigate the role that AI plays in their groundbreaking platform. We also delve into the details of the Flux method, the Flux model, and Flux Copilot, and discuss why working smarter, not harder, is cornerstone to the Flux mission. A little later on, I also investigate why the discovery of phosphorus at the edge of the galaxy could mean that alien life is more common than we previously considered. All right, let's bring in Matthias to Fish Fry. Hi, Matthias. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi, Amelia. Great uh, for having us. Absolutely. Okay, so for my audience who may not know, what is Flux all about and how did you guys come to be? Yeah, good question. I mean, Flux is like a modern design platform to design PCB boards and electronics. How that came to be is that, you know, I had worked a decade in software after working a decade in hardware, and I wanted to get back into hardware. And I felt like that there had been no progress in hardware design tooling. And I got really frustrated by that and started talking with friends about it that worked, you know, friends who worked at Apple on the iPhone and other companies and People were like, yeah, you know, it's been stuck somewhere in the 80s, 90s, you know, uh, on the tooling side, where like in the same time, everything else had advanced so much. I mean, just think about how much better Google Docs is versus uh, Microsoft Word or how much better software engineering is thanks to GitHub and VS Code and all these things. And yeah, and at the same time, you know, half design has been stagnant, while at the same time, the ecosystem has matured, right? Like it, if you think about today as a hobbyist or like small company, I can easily get something manufactured in Shenzhen without ever going there. Right. That wasn't like a thing you couldn't do 15 years ago. So there's been lots of a group in the ecosystem, but the tooling just hasn't kept up. Right. And so, yeah, you know, I decided I wanted better tooling for myself and everybody I talked to wanted better tooling. And so I decided to build that tooling, you know, and so we started Flux in 2019. That's great. So tell me more about the Flux method. Yeah, the flux method, right? I think, you know, the, the basic principles that came back to that, like, you know, in electronics, there was a lot of repetitive and tedious work. So one of the key points of the flux method is that you never want to start from scratch. I want to be able to start on a high abstraction level. I want to be able to use my past work. I want to be able to use my team's past work. And I want to be able to use, you know, the engineering community's past work and not just have to re-implement an amplifier for the one millionth time, right? So that's the first one. Then, yeah, you know, this whole thing of like working smarter, not harder, right? We have an AI copilot in the design tool, right? That just imagine you, you need some information from like the thousand page ESP32 data sheet, right? I'm not going to spend the next two days searching for that, right? So we have an AI copilot that can help answer questions. You know, you need to figure out how to connect an Ethernet uh, receptacle to a microcontroller, right? And you've never done this before. Yeah, I don't want to spend two days reading up on how to do that, you know? We can have the AI copilot do that. Same with like more simple things like impedance pair matching. I want the tool to do that for me. I don't want to do that manually. That's what we mean. Like when, you know, we say like work smarter, not harder. Have the tool do the work for you or help you do the work. And then the third pillar is, you know, working better together. I'm a big believer in collaboration and working as a team and working across teams. And I've only seen benefits to that in my career and designing electronics because of the legacy tooling has been such an isolated craft, right? And now with Flux, we really have been unleashing this supercharged collaboration environment here where you can not just work with people that you don't know, like with, you know, with untrusted parties, but also with trusted parties, right? You can be in the same project at the same time and make edits together, just like you can in a Google Doc, right? You can use components and sub layouts and like, you know, modules that other people have built and use them in your project, you know, and you have a trusted process to review that and all that. Yeah. So, you know, that's our collaboration. And then, you know, a lot of what we do here is when we design Flux and the features is that we think about, look, we want Flux to feel like playing a guitar. Like when you're playing guitar, right, 
it's really easy to say in the flow, but you want to change the core progression. There isn't like a model going to pop up and asking you five times if you're sure you want to change the core progression, right? You just change the chord progression. And that keeps you in the flow as you're playing guitar. And we want design tool to feel the same way. I mean, in the end, right, electrical engineering is part of the creative act. We want to acknowledge that in the tooling, that this is a creative tool that we're building. And we want to help keep people in the flow while they do so. I love that. Now, can you talk to me a bit about the different elements involved in the flux model? Yeah, totally. And so, you know, there's like three big pillars here. On one side, we're borrowing a lot of ideas from GitHub, where you have these like asynchronous and synchronous ways to collaborate with trusted and untrusted parties in your repos with pull requests and all that. And you also have this element of this like global repository that's community built of reusable components, right, in software. And we're bringing these ideas, you know, into the electronics world. And then the next pillar is if you think about tools like Figma or Google Docs that are authoring tools that live in the browser, that are real-time collaborative, that are rich, right? We're bringing that over to Flux, right? We're giving you a full CAD design tool in the browser that's real-time collaborative. And then the third pillar is think your Jarvis from Iron Man, right? This AI agent that can design hardware for you. And that sounds a little bit fantastical, but if you look at what Flux can do today, it turns out that the future is now. You can, through conversation with the Flux Copilot, you can design hardware and you can brainstorm on ideas. Like you want to build a smart chocolate brownie oven, right? You can like ideate with the AI agent on the bill of materials here and how to approach the problem. You can define requirements and the AI agent will help you pick the right components, connect them correctly and set them up correctly so that you then uh, yeah, get just faster, you know, to a, a working piece of hardware. Okay, so... I'm also really interested in the that Flux co-pilot you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Tell me more about that. Yeah, you know, it's like ChatGPT on steroids, right? What's done here is that you have your project and your projects are collaborative and you have like chat threads in your project, very similar to like how you have chat threads in, say, Google Docs. And what we've done is here, we've added an AI agent to that that you can talk to. So instead of just talking to your colleague, John, right, or, or Susan, you can talk to co-pilot here and ask co-pilot questions and have co-pilot perform actions. So just like you can ask a colleague of yours to perform actions in the project. Be like, hey, look, I don't know how to design a power supply the right way. Can you do that for me? And so in the same way, co-pilot can do that for you. And the, the difference is that co-pilot, right, has real-time access to data sheets and all information where like your colleagues, you know, they might sometimes be like, yeah, I vaguely remember, or I have to like actually read that up now, spend the next two days doing that. Co-pilot can perform all these actions instantly. And so it's a huge time saver and it increases accuracy because you're not just guessing. Okay, so what if my audience is using Eagle or Altium tools? What does the migration flow look like to Flux? Yeah, it's really simple. We've made sure that Flux is really easy to use, really easy to learn for all the things that maybe are not so intuitive or advanced. We have really incredible documentation tutorials. You know, we've also lots of users in the community who've been making great tutorials and writing great documentation. And then, but as it relates to getting your parts over, what's great about Flux is that it comes with this built-in community library, with, you know, hundreds of thousands of components and modules that you can pick from. And so that you don't have to start from scratch, like when you started with Eagle or started with Altium Designer, whatever tool you come from, all right? So here is like a very vibrant community that has created all this content for you and has not just created the simplest form of the virtual representation of a semiconductor, let's say, by having the symbol and the footprint. It's like, no, on Flux, people have really iterated on the ergonomics for these parts. You know, one of the exciting things in Flux is that right, components in the Flux library aren't just a static representation. They are actually little apps. You can actually write code to make them dynamic. And so people have built lots of little cool little tools and helpers to streamline their workflows. You know, one of the things they have built is like something we call generic components, like a generic resistor. Because if you think about these like bread and butter components, like resistors, inductors, LEDs, and whatnot, you know, typically when you start designing or brainstorming on the schematic, right, you don't exactly know which manufacturer, which exact resistor you're going to take, right? You want to decide this later and go back and forth a couple of times. And so you can take a generic resistor where you can not just change the resistance at any point in time, you can also change the package uh, code and all this kind of stuff. And it will dynamically change without you having to replace that component all the time. And so it makes it really easy to iterate, makes it really easy to brainstorm, makes it really easy to go back and forth, you know, and really, again, goes back to this idea that we want you to stay in the flow, right? And be really forgiving with you, you know, that you can move backwards, forwards, sideways at any point in time and never get stuck or have to undo a bunch of work. I love that. So you mentioned tutorials and other assistance for engineers. Talk to me a bit about that. 
yeah, you know, we have a really vibrant ecosystem here. Like we ourselves, we make a lot of tutorials and documentation, of course, you know, we have a really large collection on our YouTube channel, but then also like, you know, we have a very vibrant user community on Slack where yeah, users create a lot of tutorials and a lot of documentation, you know, and a lot of example projects and they open source their projects or their components or their modules, but like there might be somebody who's really good at antenna design, you know? And that person, that user will like just publish a bunch of the antennas for common use cases, you know, or like somebody gets really into Molex plugs, you know, creates a really cool library and publishes that, but all the Molex plugs, you know, and really thinks through the ergonomics of that. So it's been really fun to see that there's like similar, like on GitHub, right? On Flux, there's a really healthy competition of users to build the best virtual representation of components. All right. Well, before I let you go, it's time for your off the cuff question. So yeah. if you could have one meal right now, it doesn't matter if it's on the other side of the world, you need a passport to get there. What would you have? Uh, that's a good question. I once went to Tokyo and I had this really incredible sushi at the Tokyo fish market, you know, that I stood five hours in line for. If I could have that right now, yeah, I would. I love it. That sounds wonderful. Well, Mateus, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much, Amelia. It's great to be here. Did you hear about the discovery of phosphorus in the outer reaches of the galaxy? And folks, this may mean that life out there is more common than we think. All right, let's back up a bit. We all know that life on Earth depends on six very critical elements. Nitrogen, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur, or NCHOPS elements as they are referred to. Now, most of these elements are easily found in space because they are the result of low mass stars reaching the end of their lives. But phosphorus, not so much. Until now, phosphorus was considered rare. Well, why is that? Well, Lucy Zeres, corresponding author of this study, explains it like this. She says, To make phosphorus, you need some kind of violent event. It is thought that phosphorus is created in supernova explosions. And for that, you need a star that has at least 20 times the mass of the sun. In other words, if you're going to have life, you better be near a supernova, if that's indeed the only source where phosphorus is created. But this notion that phosphorus was a rarity in space, well, that changed recently, because in a new study by the University of Arizona, astronomers discovered phosphorus where it shouldn't have been, based on previous studies. And this suggests that there may be other mechanisms to create phosphorus, meaning that it may be much more abundant than we have previously considered. So, how did they find this phosphorus? Well, they were looking at a very interesting molecular cloud named WB86-621 when they were using radio telescopes at the Arizona Radio Observatory, and IRAM in Spain. And in this cloud, which is about 74,000 light years away from the center of the Milky Way, they detected signs of phosphorus nitride and phosphorus monoxide. So why is this so important? Well, that's about twice as far out as phosphorus has ever been detected. And that area of the galaxy, well, there just isn't enough matter to form those massive stars that go on to produce phosphorus when they die. So how did that phosphorus get there? Well, this team contends that low and intermediate mass stars could produce phosphorus by stripping neutrons out of carbon atoms and then adding them to silicon atoms. So signs of phosphorus have been the subject of debate for quite a while now. Other teams have found evidence of phosphorus-rich stars. 
But overall, this discovery by this team from the University of Arizona could have major implications for the possibility of alien life. Because until now, our assumption about the lack of phosphorus may have had us ruling out promising planets prematurely. Lucy Zeras explains the magnitude of their findings like this. For a planet to be habitable to life as we know it, you have to have all the NCHOPS elements, and their presence defines the galactic habitable zone. With our discovery of phosphorus, all of them have now been found at the edge of the galaxy, which extends the habitable zone all the way out to the galactic outskirts. Wow. So if you want even more information about this super cool new study or information about flux, I've included a slew of links below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com and in the description for this week's YouTube episode as well. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If you're into X, you can monitor our tweets at EE Journal TFM. And don't forget, if you would like to follow my personal account, check out Amelia D. 1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, I understand. You can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash eejournal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by me. And of course, you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. And if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to this here podcast on Spotify, Google Podcasts, Podbean, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or just about any other podcasting platform to listen to some super cool new upcoming episodes. Thank you everyone for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or heck you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com, or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of December 8th, 2023, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried.